Hello, everyone. We are here gathered today to discuss uh, Akash Kapoor's book, uh, Better to Have Gone. And so Akash is a journalist and an author, and he has had some very interesting life experiences. And so the book, Better to Have Gone, is, is about Oroville. I'm sure you're all familiar if you've read the book. And it's about, you know, what it's like to try and, and cultivate a utopian ideal in, in reality, right? And uh, we are here, we, want, we hope to hear from Akash about his experiences and about his thoughts. He just, uh, Akash describes himself as, a, as an incrementalist, which I would love to hear more about. And uh, yeah, we'll... Actually, Akash, how would you introduce yourself? And how would you... And I guess how... What my first question would be sort of... Um, what compelled you to, to write this, research and write this beautiful book? Okay, well, hello everybody. Thank you for coming out on a weekend. Um, I wish we were all sitting in a room together, you know, having a cup of tea or something, but at the same time, we're all spread around the world. So I guess we're, we're more people this way. Um, yeah, I mean, what compelled me to write the book? It's a, it's a complicated book because like it has many different you know, strands in it and so many different things came together to compel me to write the book. But the, the, the genesis of the book, and in some ways the core of the storytelling is very uh, personal. Uh, you know, my wife and I both grew up in, in this place called Oroville, which is, depending on how you look at it, it's a would-be utopia, or I call it an intentional community in India. And then we moved back there. Actually, we got together later in the US and, and then we moved back there as adults. Um, and what had happened is that she had had a very sort of strange past there where her parents, her, her mother and her adoptive father had died when she was a young girl, when she was 13, and then she was adopted uh, by her aunt and moved to New York. And so this wasn't really in the forefront of our minds when we moved back, but you know, it didn't take long to realize that this was going to be, that those sort of, those ghosts were kind of hanging over us as we were living there because the, the circumstances under which they had died, the reasons they had died were not only mysterious and obviously painful for her and for us, but also had become a kind of like a mythology in our town. Um, and so the book really began out of an impulse to understand what had happened there and how they had died. Um, and literally, you know, I can, I can sort of date, I can, I can time the specific moment of the genesis of the book because I was sitting in New York with her adoptive mother, who was the sister of, of, of her father who had died. And I opened a drawer and I found these green folders and they were stuffed full of kind of letters and diaries. And I started reading through them. And I was like, these are John's papers. John was her, her father, her adopted father. And, and she says, yes, these are John's papers. And I started reading these papers and they were amazing. They were these beautiful lyrical papers. Uh, and the thing about those papers is they, they opened up many worlds. So they opened up you know, they st started helping me understand what had happened to these specific individuals. But they also, you know, by necessity, they talked a lot about the town and about the history of Orville and what was going on there. And so it quickly became apparent to me that this was not just going to be a book about a kind of family story. It wasn't going to only be this intimate family story, which it is, but I was also going to have to write a kind of history of my town and of this utopian community because there was this intersection between their personal fates and the collective trajectory of the town. Uh, and then when you start writing about the town, the book becomes also a book about utopia and faith and idealism and the quest to make a better world. Um, and so all these strands really came together. I mean, so this is, you know, it's a deeply personal book. It's also a history of a particular community. It's also a broader investigation of utopia, faith, idealism. When does spirituality become religion? What does it mean? Um, that's what the book's about. And, you know, that's kind of a long way of, of answering your question, I guess. I'll try to keep my other answers shorter, but, you know, I felt like I needed to set the, the foundations here. Yeah, I mean, so we're here to discuss your book. So as long as, as much detail as you want to get into. And I, I, a thing that really struck me is that, you know, so the writing is really good. And, <laughs> and uh, I, I love how, you know, even though Orwell was found, founded in like the 60s, you go all the way back to, to before, to, to the context in which the early members were raised and like World War II, like you had this bit where you said that, uh, you know, Oroville really began from the rubble of World War II. I thought that was very evocative and true. It felt very true. And it's just, I, I like how you kind of contextualize the broader scale and scope of everything. 
Yeah. Kanye. Yeah. Um, do you want me to address that? Should yeah. I yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you know that's always like when you're writing nonfiction, you it, it's you all you want to tell a particular story, but you you also want to tell a broader story, and that was particularly particularly the case in this book. As I said, it was it, it the sort of narrative and emotional core of the book is a family story, but it's painted on a much wider canvas, uh, historically, imaginatively, because these these things of like, you know, on on the one hand, like one of the things I thought about when I was writing the book is one plausible reaction to the book is like, well, why should we care? It's one small community in South India. Uh, and some of the reviews, by one of the reviews in particular said that it's like, why would a book be devoted to like, you know, this the, the drama of a few white people freaking out in South India? I mean, I like to think the book's about more than that um, because these communities have been created throughout the ages at all scales, right? I mean, you know, uh, we, we you can go from the scale of individual intentional communities that have always existed. You also have like communism, which is like, you know, the largest utopia ever created at a much larger scale. And I think a lot of the impulses you see in these small communities exist at that larger scale. There's a, there's a quote in the book that I quote from, from Emerson, you know, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, the American uh, philosopher, where he's describing Brook Farm, which is an 18th century intentional community in, in Massachusetts. And he says something like, you know, an, it, that what was playing out there was an age of reason and small and the French Revolution and a patty pan. And so the idea again, that like they're, they're small, these communities, and, but they're, they're sort of condensations of humanities and condensations of, of history. Um, and I knew, so I knew right away that I would want to do that broader context. I'll, I'll just, you know, I'll tell you like a story. Um, when I was young and I graduated, well, I'm still young, actually, when I was younger and I graduated from, from, from college, I traveled a lot in Eastern Europe. I had a fellowship and I, I was very interested in, in understanding communism and post-communist societies, partly because of the place I had grown up. And so I remember very vividly sitting in a coffee shop in Krakow in Poland and I was reading, I don't know if any of you know Czesław Miłosz, the Polish poet, or if you know his book, The Captive Mind. And I was reading The Captive Mind, which is, it's an amazing book. It's really, it's kind of a study of idealism and faith and how people get caught up in ideology, the kind of intellectual, psychological aspect of it. And I'm sitting there reading this book and I'm thinking, I mean, I know this story. This is exactly what I lived in South India, right? Uh, which is kind of weird. And so, you know, the point is that here is a, a Polish poet writing about how his friends converted to communism in Poland in middle of the 20th century. And I'm seeing all kinds of resonances with the community in which I grew up uh, in South India. Yeah, it's so, it's so universal. So like even I found myself when I was reading it, so I haven't had any experience that's of that scale, but you know, I participated in the local music scene in my community in Singapore. And, and there are similar dynamics, you know, people with different levels of idealism. I like how this part where you point out how there are the very, very passionate, um, strident idealists, and then the people who kind of stumble into it. And I, I, I recognize that exact same mm -hmm. dynamic where there are different people who are in the space for different reasons, and there's conflicts between those things. It's very universal. Yeah, right. You're right. I don't think we don't even need to, you know, restrict ourselves to thinking about, uh, you know, utopias or would-be utopias or, or, or grand projects like communism, because these are impulses we see in our everyday life, right? I mean, we see them, we certainly see them in politics, you know, there's, there's, as you were referring to earlier, there's, a, there's an ongoing debate in the United States, but everywhere in the world between incrementalism and radicalism. Uh, this, is, this is mainstream politics. You see this if you're a member of, a, of your local co-op in your kind of like in your neighborhood, probably, you know, about how the co-op should be run. So these you always have the people who are like, no, no, you know, let's let's be more practical, let's be more pragmatic about how we build this thing. And then you have the people who, well, like the only way, you know, the world's messed up, and the only way to, to bring about genuine change is to sort of like tear down the, to, you know, bring down the fort and and rebuild it from scratch. So yeah, these things play out everywhere. Maybe they play out in in, in people's marriages as well. I mean, they're just they're they're kind of like human impulses. Um, and I do say somewhere in the book, I say something like you know, that utopianism is probably, if, if you think of utopianism as the urge to create a better world, it's a, it's a universal impulse, right? And then it's a matter of how you channel that, that impulse and that desire and that urge. Yeah. Tanya? We have, we have a couple of questions. I'll just also pay attention to the chat. Um, yeah. Eloy asked, if you had to write the book again and not from a family standpoint, would you use a different device or what device would you use? That's a good question. I mean, 
you know, pretty much all my life, like even before I was writing, I had people telling me I should write about Oracle. Right. And I've always had editors asking me to write about Oroville and asking me to write about my childhood in Oroville because it's it's quite unusual. Um, and I and I and I didn't. And maybe that's partly because I needed to be a bit older and more mature and have more perspective on it. But I think partly it was a matter of finding the right vehicle or, or device, as you call it, to write the story, um, because I think there's a there's a way. You know, without the right device, there's a way in which the story becomes a kind of dry sociological tome, right? And and you could you know you could write, I could I could see a good social sociology thesis on Orville, but I but that's not the book that that I wanted to write. Um, and so I guess I just waited for the right vehicle to come along. I don't know right now if it if it weren't for this family story, I don't know that I have another vehicle. I mean, maybe I could have done a portrait of 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 several individuals in the community and written their stories. It could have been interesting. I think that the family story and this particular family story that you know is fairly dramatic and emotional gives the book a kind of core, like an emotional core and an emotional sensibility that I think speaks to readers. Um, because it was, you know, when I was writing the book, I, I, I thought about this, like how much history and how much sociology of the place to include, because you need it. I think it's fascinating. A lot of readers think it's fascinating, but it can also get a little bit dry. And so I think interjecting it with the personal story uh, makes the book more gripping. And I also just think I love books that move scales, you know, so moving between the intimate to the epic and moving between the intimate to the, to the historical, I think gives a book different registers. It's like a piece of music that moves around and has different registers. And, and I think that makes, uh, you know, just as, as a kind of work of writing more interesting. Yeah, I definitely found that while reading it, you know, so I was, I was reading it kind of to prepare for the salon, but like as I was reading it, I was enjoying the way that you would go from just talking about, you know, the social scenes that people hung out with and just the, the spirit of the times from before. And, and just it, it's, it's, it's pleasurable and interesting to inhabit those different um, scales, like you mentioned. Yeah, it's really, it's really it's, nice. Yeah. It's also, you know, incredibly challenging as a writer. It made the job yeah, much harder, right? Because you're just, you're, con you know, you're like, you write an early draft and then there's a process of calibration, right? You have to keep coming back and recalibrating and, you know, did I go too far here? Oh, you know, we're missing a little John and Dion here. And so you just at a kind of technical level, you're, con you're constantly recalibrating. And then of course, everybody has different reactions to different strands. So at the end of the day, you just have to kind of trust your own, your own instincts as, as a writer, because certainly in the reaction to the book, some people would have wanted a little bit more of the kind of Oroville history strand and some people would have wanted a little bit less. And, and, and you see that. So yeah, at the end of the day, you just kind of have to go with your own, your own feelings and instincts about it. Yeah. If it was just us, I would probably want to spend the whole, the rest of the evening kind of talking about your writing process because I'm biased to, to enjoy that kind of thing. Uh, but so, so super quickly though, uh, so uh, Better to Have Gone is your second book, right? Previously, you've written a book about uh, India becoming, right? And, uh, and you, you, you do journalism in general, so you, you have a lot of experience writing. I'm kind of curious about how your first book may have informed your second book, not necessarily, not necessarily like topically, but just as, as a writer, your experience. Right. Uh, anything then this is a very selfish question from my part because I'm, I'm writing a book myself and i'm like always eager to hear how other people's work through it yeah um i guess i mean so first of all their, their books are quite different you know and i and i think i think that's good i like some some people they sort of get known for one type of work and then they they repeat it and 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 maybe you know, strictly in terms of like building an audience or like career or whatever, that may be a smarter way to go because you kind of build incrementally on an audience. I, as a writer, like kind of reinventing the process each time. I find I find that more like fresh and more invigorating than kind of just like doing the same thing. I guess what I would say, one thing that I figured out, overall, this was a harder book to, to write, but one thing that was easier, and, and, and this may be a lesson that I learned, is, you know, the difference between a book and an article is that you have to carry a narrative arc over 400 pages or whatever it is, right? And that's that's very, very hard. You have these strands, you have to keep the momentum going, uh, and that's very hard. And so with the last book, uh, I hadn't figured that out before the book. I, I had sold a proposal that was about 15 or, or, or 20 pages, and then I kind of wrote the book, and then I get to the end of the book and I'm like, where's the storyline here? And then I had to rewrite the whole thing 
and, and that was very hard. Whereas here, partly because I had a better agent who made me work harder on the proposal, and partly because the story itself had a natural arc in a way, I had figured out much more of the kind of storyline before I wrote the book. And so what I wanna say is it is so much easier to figure out what your book is about and the storyline over 20 pages than it is over 400 pages. Um, it doesn't mean that you know, you're just gonna then like crank out the 400 pages. There were lots of things I still had to figure out and there were lots of problems I ran into, but I just felt like having the kind of basic architecture in place allowed me to make those 400 pages better because I didn't have to like keep thinking about like what is the what is the basic arc of the story that was already somewhat clearer in my mind. What, what's some stuff that you definitely would have had to leave stuff out right because you, you said it's been like 10 years like what, what, what were some of the challenges or thoughts there? On leaving stuff out? Yeah I mean you know that's always one of the hardest things as a writer and you know there's that I, I'm sure some of you have heard that famous expression, you know, that a good editor will say, kill your babies, kill your babies, like the lines and the scenes that you that you love most and that you're most attached to may not be the ones that are most resonant. So you have to leave a lot out. Um, you, I think of writing as it's kind of an act of empathy. And it's like you have writers, I think some sometimes bad writers are fairly narcissistic, right? And they, they leave in what's fun for them. But the empathy is empathy for your reader. And you have to think like, what is my, like, keep reading this thing out loud and think like, is the reader going to get bored here? Is the reader going to like, you know, are their eyes going to glaze over? Uh, and if yes, no matter how much you love the material, probably get rid of it, right? Um, so in this, in this book in particular, uh, a lot of amazing material about, um, you know, Orville and the revolution in Orville and the kind of cultural battles in Orville, this more of the sociological stuff. I mean, I had great moments. I had moments when I interviewed people and they they opened up to me and they kind of like bared their souls to me. Uh, and I had those in early drafts. But at the end of the day, I think too much of that would have made, you know, readers' eyes glaze over. I did kind of have a fantasy that that like in the paperback draft, I would I would do in the paperback version, I would do some kind of like, uh, you know, director's cut like they do with movies sometimes where you just sort of stuff everything back in there. Uh, because like, you know, the critics have already read the book. And so now you want to make the book a little boring, like nobody's going to, you know, you're not going to get a negative review. But, uh, but I, I don't know, at the end of the day, I, I, I didn't. And so there's no, there's no director's cut. There's just all this great material sitting on my computer somewhere. That's, that's cool to hear, like the, that the process is like that. Um, Eloy, you have any, any questions, thoughts? Yeah, uh, thank you, Visa. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, just I don't think that your, your question about the writing process was selfish at all, because I think it's, it ties into the whole point of like, it, it, it's, it you kill one bird, two birds with one stone. Because I feel that like the, the reason I ask this is that the process of writing something is very much like writing is like building a society, right? Because you really cannot write a book by force, right? You And that's the whole point of the French disconstruction, the, the, the French, Postmodern writers, right? That they basically wrote the philosophy um, about trying the thing that no, it was philosophy that nobody could understand because it was um, they wrote really like convoluted French. Imagine that. Um, but the thing about what the what what is interesting about the question or your question is that is that the process of of building society is very much like crafting a narrative that is shared amongst its its people, right? Um, and my, my question to Akash would be, when, when in, 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 in the story, like you, you start seeing when the narrative starts falling down. Um, so when, when, is the, when do you think is the process, when is the time that the crafting the narrative that you are, uh, of the narrative of the society, uh, when it just comes, start it starts cracking. Like when when does like and 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 see it from the lens of you writing the book. When when do you realize that your book doesn't have like the emotional force, um, and that you need to have like some sort of emotional like uh, emotional drive in order for the for the character the character arc to work. And and I'll end it here is because sometimes you might feel that. In order for a person, like like people to grow on the book, 
they need to be like it, it needs to be fighting against something. There needs to be some sort of like constraint that allows for human flourishing. And sometimes utopian uh, projects fail because they, the, the narrative starts falling down when there is no such, uh, the constraint is against nature, but it's not a constraint against the, the, the institutions. But that's, but I, I would like to hear your points on, on, on that because I found it very striking about when Lisa asked the question and you were talking about the writing process, it, is, it, it seemed a lot that, of what was in the book. Right. I think, I mean, I could probably have something, I'm trying to think more interesting to say about, you know, when does the society start falling apart? So let me, let me, let me start with that. And then the, the writing, I mean, I have some thoughts, but it's probably less interesting. So, I mean, I think one thing you see with these intentional communities over and over in history, there's a, there's a pretty clear point when, when, you know, things start going wrong it's usually when the founder dies. Um, and, you know, so you, you, you get the founder who is the kind, usually a magnetic kind of charismatic person that brings these places together. Um, importantly, is the authority that makes decisions. And so when there are conflicts of values or conflicts of principles or conflicts of interpretation of the founding principles of these places, uh, you know, they just go to the founder. And in this case, the founder of Oroville was a French woman, Mira Alfasa, known as the mother. And I was really struck when I was doing my research how she was she was involved in the most micro details. Like she wasn't just you know approving the, the sort of like big master plan for the town. She was naming babies. She was pointing to specific locations where they should be digging bore wells for water. Um, and so she was like one you know one man government kind of managing the thing. And so when she uh, you know passes away quite early in in the community's history, um, almost right away you start having basically you know human jealousy human rivalry who is now in, who is in charge of this place who is going to be running this place and this is something you see over and over right throughout history like if you look at it, the history of intentional communities um consistently they kind of fall apart after the founder uh, leaves the place um i think or Oracle's story is very remarkable so it goes through like 10 periods of great turbulence because of this uh which is basically a kind of civil war or revolution which i write about in the book but, but Oracle story is quite remarkable because it actually comes through that and survives. And I write, uh, you know, I end the book on Oracle's 50th anniversary. It's now, um, you know, 53 years old. Uh, so it's quite unusual in for these types of communities to have survived that long. Um, and so, you know, I make the case that the book actually ends on a kind of optimistic or positive note which uh, not everybody agrees with. And, and I think it's fair, you know, I mean, like I've certainly seen reviews that are like, he, you know, that yeah, I've, I've spent all these pages writing about all this crazy, horrible stuff that happened. And then I suddenly end with like on a light note of transcendence and uh, many reviewers, I was struck actually by how many reviewers would say, oh, good book, nice writing, but I don't get the conclusion. Uh, there were very few that sort of agreed with the conclusion and, you know, that's fine. As a writer, you, you, you learn from, from what your critics say. Uh, but yeah, that's the, that would be the answer on society. Do you want me to also talk about the pros or do you wanna, you wanna stick to the kind of when the social narrative falls apart? I think Eloy's question, how I interpret Eloy's question is kind of just the, the, the parallels between uh, narrative, right, the narrative of that uh, an author is writing and the narrative that plays out in, in a community yeah. or society, right? And yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't know. It's hard to, to draw specific parallels. The act, the, of course, creating a society is, is, is a matter of creating a narrative. Uh, but let's keep in mind that it's, you know, the act of writing is highly individualistic. And ultimately, you are the dictator, you know, and, and you decide what goes on that page. Whereas creating a cohesive society is a matter of, br of, of bringing together hundreds or thousands of people's points of views and creating some kind of system that while it may not be able to reach agreement, uh, at least achieve some kind of balance and a sense of buy-in or legitimacy by all these people. So um, certainly they're both narratives and, and, and the narratives can both fall apart at a certain stage. And maybe I would go so far as to say, which I think you were, you were suggesting that in both cases, you know, the narrative can kindly fall apart when you move too far into concept and away from kind of like human flesh and blood. But I do think that they're quite different, different uh, processes and, and, and very sort of like different kinds of, of, of narratives. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, Vivek, I'm going to get to you in a, in a bit, but I'm just, I just want to expand on the thing that you mentioned earlier, Akash, which is that you said that it's unusual that Oroville has made it to 50 years and that you know, a lot of communities that try don't make it that far. And do you have any thoughts about kind of like how or why or like just what's your impression com com in comparison to everything else that you're aware of? Yeah, well, there, you know, you, there are some specific mechanisms that are specific to Oroville. Essentially, you know, the, the, when, when there was all this conflict, the, the Indian government created a kind of umbrella organization that, that, that sort of protected it. Um, and, you know, but, and those are quite specific mechanics. But I, but I would say at a, at a sort of broader level, you know, if, if you were trying to extrapolate something from it that was applicable to other societies and, and other sort of communities like this, um, I think that like the way I look at it is it was essentially a clash between hardcore idealism or ideology on the one hand and a more kind of organic human view of things that acknowledge the complexity of, of human beings and acknowledge basic human values and, 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 and believed in the dream and believed in the plan, but also recognized that that had to interact with, with human reality. And I would say at a, at a sort of like broad level, that's what the conflict was about. Um, and you know the latter view kind of won out. Whether that was a uh, whether that was luck or whether that was just a, a case of like numbers that more or more Oravillians were sort of in that camp is hard to say. But you know my 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 view in general of these communities, and I think history sort of bears them out, is that when they stick too rigidly to a blueprint and to a kind of top down hierarchical idea of what the community must be. Well, sooner or later, you run up against the fact that human nature is not like particularly compatible with a blueprint, right? And, and things start falling apart. So you need, it's very hard, but you need visions and you need sort of like ideals that, that are idealistic and that have principles, but that are also able to accommodate um, human beings and their, their complex, often contradictory needs, uh, and, and that are able to sort of be flexible and, and change over time. And I think that Orville did manage that. And, and I give the community for all that is not utopian about it. I give it a lot of credit um, for that. And, and I'll, I'll also say on that note, uh, people often ask me how Orvillians would react to the book. Uh, and I was apprehensive, right? Uh, and, and the reaction has not been universally positive, of course, but there's been a lot of positive reaction. And it's sort of, I find it very, um, yeah, I find it very kind of, you know, compelling and, and very reassuring that it remains a community that is able to sort of like process a view like mine, which is obviously not the party line. And even if you don't agree with it, like you accept it as one strand within the community and that people have these kinds of views. And so when people ask me, as they sometimes do, you know, is Orville a cult? I'm like, no, because in a cult, I would have been burned at the stake by now, right? I mean, I, I wouldn't be here to talk to you guys. That's interesting. Yeah, I think that even there are people who would say that there are, you know, like business organizations, for example, that are incredibly hostile to anyone who has a dissenting view. And so that's mm -hmm. especially quite remarkable that an intentional community, you know, isn't uniformly kind of uh, very against a dissenting view. Uh, Vivek, do you have any thoughts, questions? Uh, you're on mute. Yeah, uh, thanks, Visa. Uh, thanks, Akash, for being here. And thanks, Visa and Tanya for uh, putting this together. Uh, so I had a couple of questions when reading your uh, the, the review and uh, a few of the reviews. Um, so what what endlessly fascinating question was when you go into how you and uh, uh, your wife had you know when when you moved from so you grew up in Oroville and then Pondicherry in South India and then when you come to the U.S. Uh, you you know you know then you go go on to go to Harvard you're not actually able to, when you're dating, relate to people who can't understand that very, very specific experience. And that so seems so fascinating to me because um, for me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to understand, could you talk a little bit more about um, how, how it felt to socialize with, um, for want of a better word, normies uh, who have not uh, been through this or understood at a deep level this very formative experience in your life. Yeah, I know. I know exactly what line you're referring to in the New York Times piece. Um, and so my initial reaction to that is that was something I said that was maybe a little overplayed in the piece because it said something about 
dating other people, being very awkward. Um, and so I want to make the case that I was fairly normal. I wasn't just some kind of like weirdo outsider. Um, and in fact, so I had a girlfriend in college and, and she read that and she sent me a, a, a message, you know, a WhatsApp saying something like, glad to know I was part of the awkward phase or, or something like that, right? So um, yeah, I know, I know what you're referring to. Like, you know, it, of course it's true, right? I mean, and I, I don't want to overstate it because I think we all come with our unusual particular baggage and backgrounds to the world, um, especially those of us who are immigrants, who are, who are cross-cultural immigrants. Um, and so, you know, part of life, particularly in the 21st century, is navigating those differences. Um, I think we've moved past the stage of like, you know, I don't know, V.S. Naipaul moving to England in the 50s or 60s and feeling completely like an strange outsider because he's the only brown man like anywhere to be seen. Um, so I, 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 you know, I, I have plenty of friends in the real world and in the normal world, and I don't, I don't feel incredibly alienated. I do feel like I belong to different worlds. Um, and I feel that that the world, so I, you know, I belong to like a US world, I belong to an Indian world. And then there's this third world, which is Orville, which is very unusual and very different. Um, and sometimes, it, yeah, it's like, it's a little bit of a secret life, right? I mean, people don't really understand it. People don't really know it. Um, a lot of my friends, normies, as you call them, who read the book, their reaction was like, oh, I knew you came from a weird place, but I didn't know quite how weird, you know, <laughs> like, like now, we, now I understand. That was sort of, that was sort of the, the, the reaction. Um, but I think, I think we all like, that's part of navigating life and that's part of navigating reality. Uh, and I don't bear it as a burden or as a cross most of the time. I, I think it's a privilege to belong to multiple worlds. Um, I, feel, I feel lucky to have friends who inhabit different realities. Um, and I assume that most people inhabit different realities. I wouldn't, I wouldn't presume that any of you that I, you know, I mean, I don't know you very well, but let's say somebody I know very well, I still don't understand where they come from or whatever. So, yeah. That's actually a very nice segue to talk a little bit about the II itself, the inter-intellect, which is the, the people here who show up for these salons. Um, I, I would say I, in my, so I've hosted a bunch of these salons and Tanya has as well. And I, I think some of the other people here may or may not have. And I, I do think that the II kind of has, it does appeal to people who have kind of cross cultural experiences of like, so immigrants, people who have made big life changes, people who, who are curious about people from other parts of the world and had different experiences. And I think one of the questions that we had kind of, you know, uh, like maybe we should ask Akash this is kind of, um, how do you feel about, you know, contrasting an utopian attempt like Oroville's, which was kind of secluded in a, in a physical location, compared to, you know, now we have this digital age where we can reach out to people across the planet instantaneously. And whether, you know, um, it, can a movement that attempts to, to try and cultivate some kind of uh, ideal, you know, can... can is I'm not even sure entirely what exactly my question is, but like, do, do you see the, the sort of contrast that has happened in the world since Oroville and how has that, I guess, I guess to kind of get really broad, how has like the digital digitalization and the, the, the multimedia kind of globalization stuff um, impacted in your view, uh, things like Oroville versus let's say if Oroville were to be founded today, right? Like well, how, how would it be different? And uh, is it possible anymore? Is that desirable, undesirable, whatever you, whatever you um, I have uh, something else to add to Visa's question, which might be on the same lines, yeah. is, um, you know, Oroville, uh, from what I've read from the book and what I've experienced also in India is, it was created at a time where people had a lot of passion, a lot of dedication, that kind of pure intent, right? Um, so what I want to tie back to this question is, do you think in today's almost online world, that kind of pure intent is possible to bring about that kind of a utopian society, which has stood the test of time for like 50 plus years? Right. Well, you know, I think that any utopia is very much a product. It, its specific manifestation is very much a product of the historical moment, right? So that the, the impulse is universal and probably lasts across time, you know, like, let's create a better world, let's create a more just world. But then the specific manifestations it takes tend to be very much reflections of, of that historical moment. And, and often you could even see them as critiques of that moment, right? They come out in reaction to that moment. So in that sense, Oroville is very much a product of the 60s, 
and some of the values that it, that it, that it projects are, are very much like, you know, 60s values, like it came out of partly the hippie movement, it came out of the kind of the, the intersection, the, the Western interest in Eastern spirituality at the time. Um, so, so in that way, it's very specific. Um, but I think that the, you know, the, the broader impulse continues and exists. And I mean, I would even argue in some ways is, is stronger now than it has been in decades. I mean, I have a, an article somewhere half written, you know, that says, are we living in, in, a, in, a, in a utopian moment, which, you know, it, it sounds like a contradiction, because I think very few of us think we're living in a utopian moment, you know, in some ways, the last few years in particular have felt pretty dystopian. But what I mean by that is that if you look historically, utopian moments often emerge from very dystopian moments, right? It's like when the world really feels at, at, at sort of like it's banging its head against the wall and things are at a standstill, um, that's actually when you have a flourishing of these movements to try to reinvent society. Um, you know, like, so post-Civil War in the US, you had all these flourishing movements. Post-World War I, you had that. Uh, certainly you had this, you saw this a lot out of World War II and the 60s continues from that. You know, the sense of like, moral bankruptcy, the sense that our institutions are failing us, the sense that our politics are failing us, the sense that we've tangled ourselves so much in knots right now, there's so much injustice, that the system just isn't working. Uh, and I think we're living in one of those moments. And I see signs, right, of like, of, of people trying to like start different, whether it's co-living or whether it's, uh, you know, billionaires starting their, their utopian cities, we're seeing it, we're, we're definitely seeing this, or even in kind of like a new radical politics, which, you know, I have my views on radicalism, but at the same time, I think is an expression of that impulse. Um, I, I'm really interested, like I've been talking to a lot of people, I'm really interested in the prospects for kind of digital, digital community, and what a digital intentional community would look like. Um, and, you know, not to be too trendy, but like, mul like multiverses and whether whether you could have a kind of a version of an intentional community in the multiverse. And I think if you think about specific historical moments and utopias emerging out of, of specific historical moments, the question, the questions we face now are things like uh, concentrations of corporate power and, and sort of data hoarding and things like that. And so the question is, can we have a multiverse that is, is ex expressly created against those values, right? That really is not about concentration of power, that really is about um, actually respecting individual privacy while at the same time realizing that there are collective benefits to, to individual data and are there ways to sort of harness the power of data and, 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 and sort of, you know, glean public good insights from it. Um, and so in more practical terms, I guess the question is like, uh, will Facebook run the multiverse or will there be some kind of Wikipedia version of the multiverse? I don't know what the question is, but I can certainly see, I certainly could see a, multi, a, a, a decentralized uh, multiverse community owned multiverse emerge that would function in many ways like like communities have in the past right and in some ways uh, in some ways would of course lack the kind of like human intimacy and touch that, that, that a place like Oroville has had but at the same time would have this kind of global reach and would be able to bring people together from all over the world um, and also in an interesting way like I think one of the, the limitations of, of historically of utopian communities is as I say in the book that they're they're all or nothing propositions. Like in order to move to Oroville, you have to give up your life, right? And and this is kind of how utopias have historically worked. That doesn't necessarily need to be true in our kind of deterritorialized de setting, right? I mean, you could we could be living our lives and yet still be part of creating something better or something new in the world because of the way the the digital landscape works. Yeah. That's there's definitely something interesting going on to watch and to, to see how it plays out. Uh, Nicholas, any thoughts? Yeah, I just wanted uh, great talk by the way. Uh, haven't got really into your book, but that's uh, on my reading list, so appreciate it. Um, one thing uh, that's kind of come into my purview with some of the alternating and uh, integrated circles that I'm in, digital and real life, is uh, the the possibility of really like nested or interrelated like bio regions, eco regions, economic things, and so. Just didn't know if you had any kind of uh, thoughts on that because it seems like at some point in time when you get just too many humans together, then all of a sudden, you know, it just you reach this threshold of, of capacity to really do the things you want to do in a utopian setting. So just thinking about like, um, is there a limit? Is there a threshold of, of capacity? And then maybe just 
situated within their bio eco region, maybe that's the optimal level of some type of governance. Obviously, we need some type of cosmic thing, supernatural, supernatural governance with climate change, et cetera. But then localism is a huge deal as well that we're seeing with the right and reactionaries and stuff like that. But maybe in the middle, you know, this kind of eco bio region. So just didn't know if you had any thoughts on that. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, as I said, I think that the utopias are, are very much commentaries on the specific historical moment. And so I think in, in thinking about the values that any utopia would, would sort of express today, I think clearly, you know, ecological sort of sensitivity and awareness would have would very much be part of it, right? So I, I, I definitely think that sort of ecological um, awareness or rebuilding or whatever you want to call it is, is part would be part of the, the utopian impulse. I guess like my my concern about the kind of ecological niches that you that you've described is you know that they they sound very exclusionary right which which by the way is is a common and age old critique of utopias including of oracle that they create these kind of like these these bubbles um, that over time develop into you know very nice places to live but that they're very kind of territorialized and that they they have a lot of the problems that like. Uh, let's say Western societies have about like immigration and 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 you know who do we let in and then they have problems with oh are people just coming in to join our our kind of good life and our welfare state and so yeah the question would be whether you could create these kind of bio regions and these ecological utopias which of course are necessary and important but whether they could be done in a way that was also where the benefits were more widespread and not shared by a, like a tiny elite who could afford to live there. Um, also, like on that note, you know, you, I don't know how far you've gotten into the book, but like to me, one of the most interesting things about Oroville is the amazing reforestation and ecological work it has done. It's one of the great success stories in the, in, in the community. Um, and I think it's interesting, not only because of that it's done great work and it's very tangible, but also because it, it wasn't part of the plan, right? Like, I just think that's so fascinating that often these, these utopian communities, like this goes back to my earlier comment about rigidity and blueprints and plans that... You know the best made plans when it comes to human beings and, and history usually don't really pan out right and so like the lesson i take from that is uh put together idealistic people that are willing to dedicate themselves to a cause and are willing to dedicate themselves to something other than personal self-enrichment and all kinds of good things can happen if you give them the room and the flexibility to manifest and not just like adhere strictly to a plan because um you know, as I say, Oroville was actually conceived of as, as pretty much like a 60s modernist, like Chandigarh or Brasilia. It was like going to be this kind of concrete city because like environmentalism wasn't a thing then. And then these people show up and instead of a concrete city, they find an abandoned terrain and they quickly realize that, well, they're not scientists or ecological workers, but they quickly realize, well, in order to survive, we're going to have to stop the runoff of water and we're going to start having to plant trees and we're going to need, and, and the next thing you know, um, they have created what's arguably the most successful reforestation project in India. Um, so that doesn't answer your question, but it's, it, it's an aside about you know what was what was done in Oracle. Nice. Thanks, Mickey. Okay. Tanya, you want to go? Yeah. Uh, one of the questions that I had for you, Akash, was um, how do you think about incrementalism? And I know Visa also touched upon this earlier versus the radical change or the you tokenism that you know the book delves into yeah so that is the one place where the book or my writing seems to really stray into like contemporary politics right and um i i, I mean what well, i have a, a line in the book where i say you know growing up in utopia is a great way to make you an incrementalist right and and my point is if you've spent your childhood around people with grand plans uh, and at the very least, those grand plans don't manifest, but worse than that, they often stray into like cruelty or, or in the name of ideology, you tend to develop a kind of skepticism and a suspicion of grand plans. And this is something I have, this is something that a lot, not all of my friends in, in Oroville share. And by the way, this is something that many, like, you know, when I was in college, many of my best friends turned out to be Eastern European, and many of them shared this, right? We had this kind of shared cynicism about rhetoric and about planning because they had just been through the same thing. And you, your, your everyday life is basically about the dissonance between what people say it's going to be and what it actually is. Uh, and I think that just makes you very skeptical about this stuff. So I've written about this before, before the book, 
Uh, and I got some interesting pushback on it, actually. Um, there was a couple of articles out there and, and, and a lot of emails accusing me of like, and I don't say this like negatively, I, I like constructive criticism. I think it's very interesting, but like, you know, labeling, I think what is something like bourgeois incrementalism or something. And like, you know, basically making the case that at this moment when the world is all tangled up, uh, what we need is radical change and incrementalism is specifically what has failed us. So, I mean, I, I get that criticism and, and, I, and, I, and I'm not even saying it's necessarily wrong because I, I also feel the need for like radical change in some ways. I do think the world is kind of at an impasse and messed up. Um, so I really do get it. And, and by the way, there's a bit of a generational thing going on here too. Um, but at the same time, you know, I worry about, about like two radical movements for change and about overly kind of, um, you know, overly ambitious plans uh, because I, I do know both from my own childhood and from reading history, I know where they often end up. Um, and so I guess that if I were to balance the two, I would say that the, the impulse for radical change um, is very noble and, and very desirable and can often be constructive, but then in the way it's implemented, like you have to kind of maintain flexibility and you don't want it to get too ideological and you want to be, and you, you know, this, this might sound kind of like old fashioned, but you just want to be sensitive to human beings and you want to be sensitive to human, to, to like lived human reality. Um, you know, one of the oldest things that, that, that keeps happening with these movements over time is kind of like, throw out the family unit, right? It's, it's like individuals and families are old world and throw them out. And somebody said this to me once about Orville, an older sort of generation Orville, and he said, you know, Orville worked fine um, until people started having families. Because the minute you have kids, you, you, you stop caring about the ideals and you're more concerned about your kids and their well-being. And I get what he's saying, but I mean, tell me what kind of community can be built over time if it's if it's basic premises like families are bad and kids should be neglected and and you know be loyal to the ideals over the kids. Like I just don't see how you build a, a world that way. Yeah, I agree, and I think uh, there was a little bit of that uh, flair even in this, uh, the the storyline of Satprem because I think I I thought that he got too much into the ideology and could not see beyond that as to what was happening around in the world, um, even around him, right? So yeah, that makes sense. Thanks, Akash. Maria, you had a question? Uh, yes, thank you. So earlier today, you mentioned this pull between hardcore ideology and accommodating for human nature and like fallible human beings. And I'm wondering like what kind of accommodations do you think this international communities need in order to survive and thrive. So like one thing you've already mentioned is that nobody burnt you at a stake for writing a critical book. So like being open to criticism seems like one of the important ones. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering like, what are the other ones that you see? Right. Um, well, so I just mentioned family, you know, I think that one of the things that does often happen in these communities is that kids are totally neglected. And, and, I, and I write about this, in the context of Orville, where the schools were shut down because you know education represented old world and, and that kind of thing. Um, I, I guess I would add a couple other things. One is recognizing the basic human need to make a living, right? I mean, I think that historically these types of these types of communities um, have have for good reason been very focused on economic justice and creating more egalitarian societies. And I absolutely support that. But when they go very far in the direction of communal property and, and, and kind of no individual incentive to, to, to make a living or no individual ability to make a living, uh, they shortchange themselves. And we can, we can debate about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think of it as a fact of human nature, right? And so what starts happening is that humans start like, you know, making money in illicit ways on the side or, you know, shortchanging, shortchanging the system in other ways. And often what happens is the so-called communal property ends up being controlled by a, a sort of inner elite and cabal. And I, and I think you just develop this extreme cynicism in the kind of economic foundations of the community that, that don't bode well for the community at all. You develop barter economies, you know, things like, you know, the old Soviet Union stories of I'll repair your TV and you give me a sausage kind of thing. And I don't think that that's, that's really how you build uh, an, an, an economy or a society over the long term. Um, the other area where this comes up a lot and certainly comes up in Oroville is at the level of what we might think of as like urban planning. And, and how these, how people, the, the, the built and the lived environment in which people must, must sort of build a community. Because often these communities begin 
with very dogmatic blueprints that are preconceptions of what the society might look like. And we all know about human propensity to try to express our ambitions through grand architecture and, and sort of grand buildings and monuments, right? But if, if these are totally unconducive to what people actually need to live and how they need to live on the ground, you're basically creating uninhabitable, uninhabitable environments. Um, and you know, this is the story of, of again, like a lot of sort of modernist architecture that came out of the 60s and things like that. Nice. Uh, Soma, you have a question? Thoughts? Yeah, I want to go be, uh, back a little bit to the children's question, because you also mentioned that in your uh, one uh, radio interview that um, the school is shut down for a few years and some of your old time friends, they just didn't went to school, but your parents, they decided to move to another town. So I wonder like how are the attitude or the, um, how to say, feelings of those children who were kind of becoming the uh, victims or becoming badly influenced by those experiments. And uh, that was a very uh, striking point for me because it's similar in China after the new Republic of China was built and many parents are going to build a new country and their children are left home and playing on the street. Um, so I want to know about your old time friends, how do they adapt or like becoming a bit awkward in a more ordinary society and um, what's your viewpoint on those experiments or those utopian um, communities and the influence on the children as a very vulnerable or very voiceless group. Yeah. Yeah, you're, I mean, I think you're, you're pointing to a really important thing, which is, um, I think it's not in this book, but in, an, in another article I wrote on Utopia, I, I, I say somewhere that children are often the biggest victims of these kinds of communities because look, it's very simple. Parents are adults, they make their choices. Uh, kids are born into it and they haven't made their choices. And so they're, and, and, and kids are at the victim, are, are at the sort of mercy of their parents who, who must choose what type of life to live for them. And for those of us who are parents, we know that this is like a huge responsibility and we need to be thinking about the future of our kids and, and the needs of our kids. Um, so, you know, in, in the case of education in Oroville, yes, it was definitely one of the more unfortunate moments in the community's history, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and the outcome of, of many of my friends has been mixed because, uh, so some people like me had parents that nonetheless like recognized the value of education and figured out ways to get their kids education. It may have been by moving to a neighboring town as my parents did, it may have been by, you know, subscribing to, to kind of community, uh, to uh, correspondence courses, um, and just kind of managing somehow to give their kids an education. There were also, and I emphasize this in the book, that there were always members of the community that thought this was ridiculous uh, and kept offering classes, you know, like kind sort of illicit classes in their houses that kids would have to sneak to hiding books under their t-shirts and things. But so all of this is to say that despite this movement, many children did end up getting an education and they went on to colleges and, and, and they flourished educationally. Um, and this is probably a testament to kind of the resilience of kids also, right? Um, for the ones who didn't, I would say, you know, feelings are mixed. I certainly have some friends that are quite bitter about those years and feel that they were, that they were cheated and they were robbed and that it's constrained their life choices. Um, other friends would not feel that way because they, they are very happy with staying in Oroville and living in Oroville. And so within that ecology, um, you know, and that society, they, they feel like they flourished and, and they don't need more than that. So, you know, I think, I think the outcomes varied, but from my perspective, it was, it was unfortunate. And I, and I would always think that um, no matter how ideologically committed a parent is, uh, a generous parent should leave open the possibility that your child may not have the same ideology as you and may not grow up to believe in the same things as you. And you should give that kid the option to choose when they're an adult. Let them decide if they want to come back and be part of this project or let them decide if they want to go out and, I don't know, be an investment banker, right? Like every, every kid decides for themselves what they want to do in the world. And our job as parents is to give them choices. Yes. Profound. <laughs> what else? Let me, let me just see what, what questions we have. Um, 
I mean, so just another, another curious, curious thing. What, what do you think is next for you, Akash, after having written this? Like, what, what, what's the next thing on your mind that you're, you're curious about or interested in? Writing-wise, you mean? Um, just what, where, where is your attention directed? What's, what are you curious about? What do you think you might? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, you know, the overwhelming impulse after finishing a book like this and bringing it into the world is to take a holiday to the Maldives for a year. You that should. Would be, that, that would be what if, or, you know, if I could just do that. Um, I'm speaking of kids, you know, if I didn't have kids right. to think about in school and all of that, that's, that may be what I would try to do. But yeah, that's not, that's not an option right now. Um, so in terms of writing, I mean, I'm quite interested, you know, we were just actually talking about the kind of digital landscape. And, um, I, you know, I actually have a PhD in like media and tech law, uh, which is sort of a strange thing. And I used to think of it as just this very dry, boring field. And I did some policy work and policy consulting, but I used to think of it as like really boring and kind of arcane. But as we know, in recent years, this has become really like important kind of tech regulation and, and, and tech ethics. And it's, it's sort of it's sort of moved to the very center of our everyday lives, right? It's no longer some kind of like arcane field. And so I'm thinking of like how to write about it in a way that gets at some of these policy or law regula regulation questions, but that's also like is a human interest story and that and that talks about how technology is, is, is changing our everyday lives for better or for worse. Um, I think I think technology is itself historically and especially now a very utopian movement. I mean, it's, it's basically a, a modern day utopia, which means that like most utopias, it also contains the seeds of dystopia. Uh, and so, you know, these are some of the things I'm, I'm trying to think through. And, and um, if the Maldives doesn't work out, that may be the next project. <laughs> I wish we could have uh, Balaji here. I don't know if you know Balaji Srinivasan. He's, he's sort of very into like, like how technology is going to spearhead sort of the post-state um, configuration of, of how people organize, like post-state media decentralized uh, just finance and all those things. And I, I wouldn't say that I, I'm well versed in that stuff, but it's interesting to observe that, you know, when people are convinced that, for example, some piece of technology may herald, so some people are convinced that it will herald utopia, like giving, you know, decentralized finance money for everybody, universal basic income. And some people feel that, oh, you know, it's, it's going to be an environmental disaster. And I don't know if the evidence is very clear in either direction, but if people feel ideologically that that's how it's going to be, then they feel like it's justified to be really, I mean, so, so far it's just loud, right? Very angry uh, criticisms of each other, but it's also easy. It's kind of scary to observe because it, you know, it starts with angry yelling and then like groups of people emerge and then they, they paint the other side as the enemy. And it just seems like it could spiral badly. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I saw on your on your site you have some thoughts about uh, universal basic income. You want any anything to say about that? Well, I think universal basic income is 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 like when I was saying earlier that we're living in a utopian moment. It's it's a good example because I mean, who would have imagined three or four years ago that the Republican Party in the U.S. would you know essentially be voting? It's not universal basic income, but like for like you know checks to be deposited in, in people's accounts. Um, and support that over classic welfare. So I think it's, a, it's an example of an idea that has long been seen as utopian, but that has quickly become kind of like more mainstream and accepted by both right and left. And so I think it's, it's, it's probably an illustration of the fact that we are like all casting about for new solutions and new ways um, of doing things. On the, um, you know, the tech point that you were just raising, I think for me, the question is not so much like the environmental issues with crypto and all that are real, but I think they're actually resolvable at a tech level. So like a lot of the cryptocurrencies are moving towards, you know, proof of stake instead of proof of work. And that, that has much less of an environmental impact. Uh, and so there are things there for me. The, the, the question is, uh, we've seen this over and over with the internet that every time a technology comes along that seems promising and emancipatory and maybe kind of community oriented, uh, there's just so much money involved that it gets co-opted by and, and becomes corporatized. And, and in that way, and, and then the promise quickly fades away. And so I think that for me is, is really the question of like, is there a way to, is there a way for these things to emerge and to manifest 
where they actually stay, whatever you want to call it, decentralized or non-corporatized or like owned by the community or, you know, there, there, there are different models for, for how this could happen. And this is what I was saying earlier with the multiverse. Um, I don't think it's a given that Facebook's going to own the multiverse. I think, I think it had, there are a lot of trust problems. And if there's a compelling multiverse out there that, that is not corporatized, I think many people would rather join that one, right? The question is just like, you know, will the UX be good enough and, and will the onboarding be easy enough or, or will it, will it, will it, you know, be kind of like only open to hackers and kind of very tech savvy people. And then so by default, everybody gravitates to the slick corporate product. Right. Yeah, we're going to see. I, I do. I, so I was just posting in the chat, like I, I collect like a thread of um, optimism about tech from the past. And so there's all these things, there's things that are funny to read now, but at the time, you know, when they invented the telegraph, people were saying that, oh, you know, we're going to have instantaneous communication and therefore we're all going to, our minds are going to beat as one and we're going to understand each other. Mm -hmm. And same for like commercial air travel, they were like, oh, now we're going to be able to visit other cultures. And so it's going to herald like a era of uh, great cultural exchange and understanding. And then now we look back and like, oh, okay, you know, with each which with each new promise, there's also new problems. Sure. Just, but let's yeah. not but let's not forget that um, despite that, like actually a lot of great things emerge from all That's these true. technologies, right? And I think we're I think we're living in a moment where for understandable reasons, uh, you know, we're living in this tech lash moment. And I think that that's, that's understandable, but I think it's good to remember that the internet is also like an amazing technology that has changed, like, look at what we're doing here. I mean, you know, sure, okay, we're doing it through a corporate platform and they're probably like mining our voice and like gonna make money off of it somehow, but uh, probably not actually. But anyway, I'm just saying that we're, we're, you know, human nature, as you, this goes back to your point earlier about shouting, human nature tends to like oscillate between extremes. Um, and this is why I think, being an incrementalist is kind of a good thing. Like, let's just try to be a little calm. Let's let's look at the ways in which it's bad and try to fix it, but let's not forget the ways uh, in which it's good, right? Um, yeah. and, and I and I do think that's that's kind of relevant to the, to the discussion over technology nowadays. Yeah. By the way, this is great because I'm trying out ideas for my next book on on you guys. I'm kind of thinking out loud as as we're Fantastic. talking. Fantastic. We can totally, if you want, we can totally do a separate salon just for that, and just to get people. It's who a hot, are It's a, everybody's talking about it these days for sure. Yeah, and and I think people need sane voices. I think so. Even on my Twitter timeline, for example, like there, I have like a few friends who try to be sort of sense making, moderate, just asking like what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then like whereas the vast amount of vast majority of content that you get is from people saying, "Oh no, we are doomed," or "Oh no, this is sure. oh this is amazing." Well, um, yeah. the, the, I'll just say something about that. The thing is that you know. Um, and the word on that is that that's partly because the algorithms reward that kind of yeah. divisive inflammatory content. But, and I think that's true. But having said that, I like, this was, this has always been the story of human nature. This was always the story in Oracle. The radicals yeah. were, were a tiny group, but they were the loudest and they were the most vociferous. And most people just say, whew, I don't want to be part of this. You know, I don't want to, you, you, you start wrestling in, in the mud, you have to wrestle with the pigs or whatever the expression is, right? Or you wrestle with pigs, you get mud all over you. And so most people just kind of stay out of it and, 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 and the radical voices do tend to dominate. And I think this is the story of human history. It goes on and on and on. Yeah. Tale of two cities too, right? Like best of times, worst of times. Uh, Vivek, you have another thought, question? Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, I had a couple of uh, comments and a question here on, so first, uh, one of the quotes that was really interesting was, you know, your idea of when utopia can tip into um, dystopia, right? And one common factor seems to be, um, you know, ha a question to ask about a lot of uh, communities that may, you know, uh, about how sustainable they are is how they treat people who are not part of the community. Um, you know, who, how, what is the, re not even just people, but ideology, like how friendly or, you know, what is your relationship to the outgroup of thoughts, yeah. outgroup of people, outgroup of, I don't know, ways of living, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, uh, you know, around that, I, I, I thought, so, so that, that, that's one thought there. Um, and the other was your, your idea of, you know, being friends with people who had been burned by radicalism, like in, 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 in the Eastern European um, uh, friends that you'd mentioned, uh, it's, it seems like people who are burned by radicalism, who are, have, have had a history in, in, in that way, 
may lean towards incrementalism, right? And people who've been burned by increment, incrementalism, as we've, we're seeing now, uh, tend to, uh, you know, look to radicalism uh, to solve uh, our problems. So m my question is, having seen both of these things in, in your own life when, you know, by the time you went to the U.S., like you said, you've navigated so many different worlds, uh, what made you make the decision to come back to Oroville and which is essentially in you know in, in some ways is the utopia it's working it's it's still around it's 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 doing well you're uh you know the descriptions in the articles of your 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 your, your kids uh <laughs> being dropped off in a car and being like oh we're we're uh we feel awkward because nobody else is uh showing up in a car uh you know those kinds of things what made you make that decision and how does it feel like living in utopia I don't live in utopia, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, um, yeah. The question of like why we came back is definitely one that I I, I get a lot. And um, look, I mean, you know, different people have different levels of kind of like planning and intentionality in their lives. And so, at a conscious level, I really honestly, this is an unsatisfying answer, but I don't think we actually thought that carefully through uh, what we were doing. And I will say that. One of the, the goals in moving back, by the way, because we haven't talked much about, about India, but, you know, like uh, one of the goals in moving back was to move back to India. It was the, it was the early 2000s and India felt like it was on the cusp of like really kind of positive radical change and, and or, or I don't want to use the word radical, let's say positive change. And we were very, we were very excited about that possibility. Um, and then soon after moving back, because, you know, both my wife and I, having grown up in Oroville, we're actually deeply connected to India, right? It's not, it's not just like a, a kind of isolated bubble. Um, but what those of you who live in India or have lived in India know is what we soon find out is most Indian cities, at least, are practically uninhabitable at this stage, you know, and because of the sort of the environmental situation and, and just the kind of urban sprawl. Um, and very, and we felt was, you know, maybe particularly for us, because of, of we had grown up in a much more pleasant sort of environment, we ended up living in Oroville because um, like actually like the living conditions are much more pleasant. Now this was at the kind of conscious level. I do think that unconsciously there was all kinds of other things going on. I think um, for my wife, certainly there was this unfinished business as I refer to it in the book. Um, you know, if you leave at, as a child 13, 14, like a month or two after your parents have died and you never know what happened, this is soil that you need to come back and kind of like revisit, right? There's unfinished stuff psychologically going on. Um, and then more generally, uh, I say in the book that I do think that people who have grown up, I, I say the children of, of utopias are like exiles. Uh, and what I mean by that is you, once you're, once you're a kid, you've grown up with these ideals about how the world can be better, about how the world can be a different place. And then you grow up and you're like, you know, it's not working out. And like grownups are complicated and all kinds of bad stuff happens in the name of utopia. And I'm getting, I'm just like, I, I don't want I don't believe in this. I'm getting out of it. But again, like the notion of exile is that somewhere in the back of your mind, you're always longing for a return to that because you, you've spent your formative years believing in the possibility of a better world and believing, believing that, that the world doesn't need to be the way it is. And so, I, you know, the same way an exile who leaves a country is kind of haunted by the country they had once known, even if it no longer exists, I think we were haunted by that vision and that world and that kind of dream of a better world uh, that we had grown up in. Um, so this is me psychologizing myself, but I think that I, I do think that is one of the one of the reasons uh, we returned there. Yeah. Thanks, Prakash. I actually have a connecting question to that, but I'll come back to it later. Wade, uh, do you have a question for Akash? Uh, yeah, this kind of ties into like the the whole like network state uh, stuff from like Balaji and that. Um, and I've been very interested in this for like a number of years. Um, like growing up in Australia, I saw some intentional communities where they kind of fallen apart when the founder had died or like they turned into like a dictatorship um, and stuff like that. And or just people growing up and, they, you know, like it doesn't align with where they want to be in life and they have to mm -hmm. move to another area. Um, but they still kind of want to stay in like an intentional community. Um, and I'm just like wondering, like, do you see there being like a, a possibility of or is there any communities that have kind of done this where they've kind of like connected over like shared values and kind of like allow people to move between different communities 
Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. And I and and um, I mean, as I said earlier, I think one of the the problems with with utopia as it's historically been conceived is that it tends to be a kind of all or nothing all or nothing proposition, um, and 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 very territorialized, right? So it's like you have to live in a specific place, and as you say, and then like your life circumstances may change, and you may not want to 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 live in that place or by you know those particular rules anymore. Um, I, I mean, I don't really, I know of people who kind of bounce between intentional communities, you know, because they, they live in one and then they, they get sick of it and then they might move to, to you know, to, to another one. Like, you know, for example, there was quite a lot of traffic at a certain point between uh, Findhorn. I don't know if you know Findhorn in, in Scotland. There was quite a lot of movement between Findhorn and Oroville. Or maybe more interestingly, after the Soviet Union collapsed, there were quite a few uh, people who actually moved to Oroville from the Eastern Bloc. Um, because, you know, I suppose at some level, they still wanted to live with that level of intentionality. Um, but to go back to what we were saying earlier, like, I, this is where I think that the deterritorialized digital community could offer a, a lot of potential. Um, possibly, possibly, particularly if it's plugged into also certain territorial elements, like, I don't know, it's, it's an open question, like, I don't know to what extent we can commit ourselves entirely and live with that level of intentionality if it's just a virtual world, right? Like it may be, it may be that like the reality of everyday life, like the job and the commute and all that is just like too overwhelming. And then you never feel that intentionality is too much of a sideshow. Um, so I, I don't know that. So it may be that it has to be the, the, the virtual community provides a kind of network to your physical location. I don't know, but I think but I think it offers, I think it offers a lot of potential. Like I would be, I would be interested in being part of something like that. You know, I would love to live with. I would love to be interacting uh, with people who have a vision of a better world, who have sort of like the dream of a better world, who, who, who recognize that the existing world is kind of screwed up and want to do something different, um, but not necessarily have all the constraints that that historically has come with when you have to live in one small community in one particular location by a particular set of rules. So Akash, one question that I had, uh... When I was reading the book, I was super, super fascinated with uh, the schooling system that you have, uh, you know, mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, across the world, we are seeing uh, changes happening in educational institutions everywhere. But I wanted to kind of gather your thoughts around wh what was it like being in that school in Orwell learning and, you know, growing up versus what you see in your children's education today and how has that impacted your parenting style? Yeah. Um, well, a couple of thoughts, you know, one is that uh, people often ask me like how my childhood was, particularly in light of some of the things I've written about. And I say that, to be honest, it was pretty magical. Um, maybe we weren't as aware of certain things as we should have been. Or I just think that the, the kind of physical landscape of Oroville was really magical. We had, we had a sense of like living in a community with a strong sense of intentionality. So it, it was, it was pretty magical. Um, you know, I, for, for a variety of reasons, I was lucky I, I got a good education, despite some of the, the upheaval that happened uh, in, in that educational world. And I would say, not only like did I get a good education, but I got an excellent education, because, you know, you, 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 I was able to survive, like, by the standard academic terms, but also growing up in that kind of thing, like, you think differently, right? And so, like, when I came to the US, and, and like, I was at Harvard, I always felt like, I was surrounded by people who were much smarter than me at a, at a strictly intellectual level and who certainly like who, who were much more accomplished academically who had studied calculus much earlier than I had that kind of thing. And maybe the way I, the reason I was able to keep up with them was that I had had a childhood that taught me to think a little bit differently and think out the box and so I, I value that a lot. Um, I think my kids are receiving an excellent education I think that Oracle schools have changed they've become they become much more solid uh, they become much more standard and kind of conventional which does have, it has certain uh, downsides, you know, certain people in the community would, would complain that they're too standard now and they're too geared towards preparing kids for a kind of standard in the box education. And, and I understand that. Um, the flip side of that is that you have much, you know, the, the, the mean is much higher, right? So you don't have people falling through the cracks and, and the basic level of education that's provided is, is, is much higher, I think. Um, while still maintaining a level of, of flexibility and openness because you're not following you know, the, the, the memory by, the, the learning by memory or learning by rote uh, thing happens much less in Oracle. So I think along with uh, green work, I think education is actually one of the great successes of Oracle. 
at least till a certain age. I mean, obviously you don't go to college, um, you know. Nice. Uh, Novi, you have a question? Yeah, I, my question is kind of back to the writery question. So uh, I think I heard you say that you were working on this book for over 10 years. And I was wondering how, like when you originally got the inspiration and the idea for the book, um, and usually when you're creating something, as you start working on it, it kind of changes over time. So with 10 years, how did you cope as the valley between what you originally set out to do and how you envisioned the book to be grew from, you know, what it actually ended up being? Because I know you have to get like notes from your agents, you interview people and that kind of changes and puts you, puts you on different paths. So how do you, how did you cope or like balance as what you wanted originally kind of, the book kind of told you what it was going to be itself? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. I think it's like most things in life. It's like if you're building a business or, you know, when you're, when you're building something, uh, you start off with a kind of a notion of what it will be. And then you have to be very open to what comes your way. Right. So it's, it's, it's all, it's all a process. Um, and I don't think, you know, I, I, I don't, the, the, the final product is very different from what I had originally conceived in many ways. And I think that the book is, is richer for that because uh, like we were discussing what societies earlier, that if you come at it with a very preconceived notion and stick to that notion, you're probably going to miss a lot of reality. So, you know, more practically, like some the research for the book was, was for me, was kind of the most fun part of writing this book in many ways, because you're going out and you're, you, you have certain ideas and you, your, your ideas are very broad and you know what sort of themes you want to, you want to touch upon, but then you need to get the, the, the kind of specific direction and the content for those themes need to be filled in by the research. Um, and I love going and talking to people and hearing their stories um, and the kind of brainwaves that, that would set off and you come home and you and, and you think, oh, you know, I should have a chapter on this or I thought the chapter was going to be like this. But now when I think about it, it's going to be it's going to be about something different. Um, of course, it's difficult at times because you may have certain ideas for what you want to do and then you bump up against reality and it doesn't work anymore. Um, and it's true that I was working on the book for 10 years, not solely, you know, not exclusively. I was doing other things. I don't think a book in its early stages, particularly when it's being formed or just stated, is not like a full-time job. And I think it's actually healthy to have other things going on, to let this thing simmer and let this thing bubble. Um, and actually, you know, one of the, the unhealthy aspects of publishing as a profession or as a career and timed book contracts is that they impose artificial constraints on you. Uh, and that whether it's because you need the money or whether it's because the publisher is kind of cracking the whip on you, the book comes in before it's fully formed. Um, and so I spent a lot of time, you know, pushing back against the publishers, asking for more time. Certainly towards the end, they were getting very impatient with me. Like, the book's done. The book's done. It's good enough. It's good enough. And I said, good enough isn't good enough for me. Look, I've spent eight years on it now. What do I care if I spend another year? You know, it's like, those are, that's a sunk cost, right? And so then, you know, you, then you have to take evasive action. You stop answering your publisher's emails. You go underground, right? You, you hide from them. <laughs> you know, there's, there's all kinds of steps you have to take to just to buy just a little bit more time, you know, uh, and they, and they know, and they know the game too, right? And, they, you know, they, they play this game with, the, with their writers. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy that, that I took the time I did for this book. I mean, there were certainly moments when I was writing it, when I thought, oh my God, like I'm ruining my life and I'm ruining my family's life by devoting this much time to a single project. And there's so many other things I could be doing in the world. And I have friends who are writing books in two years or three years or whatever. But, you know, now it's done and I'm happy and I'm happy I did it. And my, and my publisher is taking me out to lunch next week. So I guess we're still friends and, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I'm definitely on the side of uh, you should, if, if it takes longer, you should take, there's, there's this great quote from, um, he, I think it's uh, Shigeru Miyamoto. He's like the Nintendo games developer. And he says something like, you know, if a, a game is late, you know, it's late for a while, but if it's bad, it's bad forever. And right. Th th that sense of like, you know. If, Very true. Yeah, anything that you produce, like media, a movie, a book, whatever, like yeah. people, the pressure is to make it within some production cycle. But like, if it's not good enough, then it gets forgotten in a few years. Whereas right. if it's really good, it can last decades. And that's yeah. really... I mean, the, of course, the, the flip side of that is that the world is full of, of artists who have been working on their book for 40 years and, and never get it done. So, you know, there is, I think, the kind of like imperatives of time and commerce on the one side 
interact with the imperatives of whatever you want to call it, creativity or art on the other. And, <laughs> and, and you need to sort of like find the, the meeting ground. And by the way, different projects take different amounts of time, right? This was, I mean, you know, my, I was joking about my publisher, but they did acknowledge along the way, so this is the kind of book we recognize it as many strands. It has a ton of research that needs to go into forming it. So it makes sense that, that it would take uh, a little bit longer. Um, so I agree with you. Like I was haunted by the idea, you know, I would say there were moments when, when the product, when I felt the book wasn't working and I would say like, then I would say to my, to my wife, I would say, well, I'm ruining my family's life by spending too much time on this, this project, but at least let it be good. Like, oh my God, imagine I spend this much time on it and it's not good. Like then it's seriously a failure. You know, it's like have something to at least cling to the fact that, 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 that you feel and by good, all I mean is that I feel I perform to the maximum level that I could, right? I, I don't mean by some objective yeah. standard that that's for somebody else to, to judge. But I don't yeah. know. Yeah, like I don't know that if I'd spent another five years on it, I personally could have made it that much better. I think I took it about as far as I could. Right. Like, And, and I think from, from me, in my case, like, so I, I've been spending about three years on a thing. I'm almost done. And the interesting thing, I think, is that as the book, and I'm curious to hear your perspective on this, especially if it's 10 years, right? as you have the book project sort of open, it, it's sort of like a lens that you view the world through simultaneously. And then if you take that long, like you live your life as you're writing it. And so you experience your own emotional highs and lows and, and you, you kind of relate your own life experience back to the book. I'm sure you experienced that, especially for such oh, totally. a well, Totally, if you're, if you're in the book, if one strand in the book is yourself, then you find the material changing in relation to your own relationship to the book. Absolutely. Um, and in the case of this book, that happened very specifically with the question of, of faith, because I started off the book as a kind of very skeptical take on the question of faith uh, and idealism, but particularly faith, spiritual faith, because I started off having grown up around people who, in my view, had too much faith. And I saw how the two people I was writing about were essentially killed by their faith. And that was kind of my opening perspective. Um, and yet while writing it, there was a weird un unanticipated process that happened where my conversations with some of these people who I had always thought had too much faith, and I still think maybe they had too much faith, but I also experienced the kind of the nobility of their faith and the aspiration of their faith and the beauty of their faith. Um, and so I surprised myself by getting to the end of the book and actually having a, a different feeling about faith. And the way I, I described it, you know, in the book, or maybe it was in an interview somewhere for the book, is it's like a door opened for me that had never been opened before. Um, and I'm not saying that I walked through that door and found faith. I, I haven't, but but it changed my own view of things. And the relevant point here to what you're saying is that this completely changed the way I wrote about faith in the book, right? The book changed as a result, instead of just being a book that critiqued faith and was down on faith, it does that, but it simultaneously tries to respect the the impulse and the aspiration if, if that makes sense yeah I, I think the book is definitely like better for it like you can feel you can see the the kind of tenderness and hum i don't know i want to use the word humility but like just the the, the like by not taking a very kind of uh, overly like it's clear that you haven't entirely sort of um fi fixed yourself to a position and that makes the book more interesting because you're willing to kind of go around uh anna you, you want to say something Hi everyone, hi Akash. I'm really just dropping in for like a couple of minutes um, between lunch and this uh, other conference module that's starting now. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Akash. I absolutely fell in love with your book. Um, yeah. It's one of the most magical things I've read in the past years. Also very difficult to read, I think, if one cares about children dying and other extreme forms of neglect. Um, just... Um, yeah, I have a long list of questions and I know that we will be meeting up in New York, so I will probably one on one <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, raise them um, and I can't wait to uh, hear what you guys cooked up today and what uh, conclusions you may have arrived at. Okay. Cheers. Um, Soma, you want to go next? I think I forgot to lower. Oh, OK. And anything else? <laughs> I thought I, I kind of rushed you because I thought someone was going to do something. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. I actually have a question. 
So it's about the uh, difference between <laughs> nonfiction writing and uh, journalistic writing because you are doing the both. And you also mentioned the fun part is doing research and doing all kind of very like slow or take your time kind of. And what do you think is the biggest difference between these two different kinds of writing? And um, yeah. yeah, that's basically Yeah, yeah, that's a good good question. I was, uh, I actually just got back from uh, Williams College and I sat in on a, a creative writing class. And so some of the students there asked me uh, the same question, the difference between like this kind of nonfiction writing and, and, and journalism. Um, I mean, there, you know, there, there are a few uh, different kind of aspects you, you can you can think of. I, I would I think that with standard journalism, which so I guess let me let me think about it this way. Like, what does objectivity and facts mean, right? Because I think those are the values that, that you would sort of like aim for or that are upheld by conventional standard journalism. And so the, the way that we had this conversation at Williams is one of the kids asked me, well, how, how much do you make up? In this book, how much is actually true, and how much do you make up? Uh, and I said, look, there's nothing in it that's made up. Like it is nonfiction, and everything's true. Um, you take certain liberties that you might not take in conventional journalism. So, for example, you will you might move scenes in time to create a cohesive narrative. Uh, you will not something that you know something that happened later. You might move to an earlier moment. You're not gonna like lie and say this happened when it didn't happen, but you're just gonna place it in the narrative where it's like slightly unclear maybe when exactly it happened, right? In order to form a cohesive narrative. In this case, there were a lot of letters and I certainly did things like edit the letters and concatenate letters and put them together uh, again in ways that, that you may not do in standard journalism. Another thing, another thing with journalism is sourcing is a big deal. So here you have a lot of quotes in this book and things that people say uh, and information that people gave me and I just kind of write it as if it's like part of the story, right? Like a novel. I don't say, um, and the color, you know, the, the color of the snake that they saw was green, according to one person who saw it that day, which is what you might do, which is what you might do in, in standard journalism. And I'm, there's nothing, I'm not critiquing like journalism. I've done it myself. And I think it's it's hugely important, right? It's just, it's, it's a different project. And so, and when I write articles for a place like the New York Times or the New Yorker, that's the kind of stuff, that's the way you write. Um, and the New Yorker in particular has a very, very extensive fact checking operation where they will literally, you know, you say that the snake was green, they will ask you like, who told you that? And they will call that person in India and say, so Akash wrote that the snake was green, was it actually green? And then the fact checker will call you back and say, well, they described it as rather emerald green, brownish. What do you think? <laughs> and you say, sure, you know, like, okay, uh, I'm just, but in, in this kind of writing, which is more narrative driven and more storytelling, you may take a few, a few liberties with those things. And one way to do that is to also declare that you've done it. So in my you know, author's note, I say that I've done that, right? So that the reader knows what you've done. Um, some, re some authors will do, which I didn't do here, they will create composite characters. These are not like even real people. They're like ostensibly like you mix two or three characters together to create an invented character. Like to me, that's kind of a, a step too far. And I feel like you're, you're straying into fiction territory and away from fact, but certainly people do it. I mean, Obama did it with uh, Dreams of My Father, his first book, he has, he has composite characters there and it didn't like really hurt his career, you know? So you can do, you can do all, you can do all kinds of things. Um, but yeah, for he, in, th in this project, like storytelling and scene building and some of the, some of the novelistic techniques were very important to me. Eloy, you had a question? Yes, just my, my question was a simple one. Uh, Akash, how do you define faith in this context? Because one can argue that like the, like if you ask a religious person, like the faith is very straightforward in that sense. Um, it's about pretty much believing things that you don't, are not for sure, don't for sure know that they exist. Um, but you have faith that they do because then if you don't believe in, I don't know, the, the big spaghetti monster in, the, in, in heaven, you're not going to go and eat spaghetti in, in heaven. But the thing is that in terms of utopian communities, how do you define faith in, in, in that context? Is, is it faith in believing that the stuff is going to work without any sort of guarantees? Is it believing 
faith in believing in other in the in the incentives or the or the nature of, of your other fellow utopian uh, community people that they're gonna make it work. Believe in like because those are things are those things are unseen too. But I don't know how you how do you frame that worldview of faith. Right. Well, it, you know, in the context of Orville um, and therefore the book, there is a very strong kind of spiritual underpinning to the community um, because of the way it was created and, and the ideology behind it. So faith specifically, I mean, in that sense, it has its fairly conventional meaning. It doesn't necessarily mean faith in the ideals of the community. It means faith in some of the spiritual teachings surrounding the community. Um, so there's a, there, like, you know, uh, like maybe one's conventional understanding of faith, it's faith in the supernatural, it's faith in something called the divine, it's faith that that divine is somehow guiding what's happening in Orville. Um, and so, and you know, for example, when uh, people die in the book, there, there are many people who believe that it's for a reason and that there's a cause and that and the mother would not have allowed this to happen without a purpose. Um, so that, that's what I mean by faith. A follow-up question to that, Akash. What do you, what do you, or from your lived experience, how do you see spirituality versus religion in the entire utopian context? Yeah, that's that's a big question, uh, and you know, I, I get into it somewhat in this book. In fact, the the Supreme Court of India gets into it. There's a scene where Orville's fate is determined in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court. One of the major questions is whether Orville is a religious project or a spiritual project, and and what the difference is. Um, I don't have a, I don't have a good answer to that other than you know the, the way I sort of come down on this. It's it's I think all these concepts, faith, idealism, dogma, spirituality, religion, it, it all exists on a kind of spectrum, right? And we and we decide where you know we decide or or it comes to us where we're placed on the spectrum, and so I think I think that some people have a sort of spiritual belief without needing a hardcore doctrine or without turning it into a hardcore doctrine. Some people go a little further along the spectrum and then you're heading towards religion. Um, and the, the, I, I quote Thomas Merton, you know, the, the Catholic monk in, in the book who talks about this in the context of, of uh, I think, doubt and belief. And he says, we, you know, that basically we all kind of exist along that road somewhere between hardcore skepticism, doubt, and utter belief and faith. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to not think of these things as binary. I certainly learned that, that's what I was talking about earlier. I certainly learned not to be binary about these things, but to think about where we place ourselves along that, that spectrum. Yeah, that, that's interesting because uh, while I was still also reading the book, um, not, but I wouldn't say it's at all similar, but Similar thing was uh, uh, done with the Osho organization where they tried to set up something mm. in US, obviously big, big failure, right? Mm -hmm. So when you look at an organization that like that, which is also surviving today in India and um, you know, an organization like Orville, which is also surviving in India, but very different histories. One had a very violent history. Orville had some violence, yes, the uprising and everything, but it did not impact people on a large scale. Mm -hmm. And I uh, just wanted to get your thoughts around that. Like, how do you see these two communities and what different lights do you see that? Yeah, I mean, people ask me this, particularly because of that Netflix documentary, you know, on, on the Osho thing, the Wild Wild West. Um, and so pe people ask me about Orville and was it a sect and would you compare it to Osho? And um, I mean, I, 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 of course I see why people would ask that. And I suppose there are analogies, but I think, but I think that they're quite different. Yeah, one of, you have to remember one of the biggest differences is that the founder of Orville left five years into Orville's creation. And so you didn't have a kind of guru figure who was the ultimate authority guiding the place. And in some ways, in some ways that was very much to the detriment of the community, of course, because the community, as we've discussed, had went through this turmoil and it was suddenly a bunch of people who had to figure out for themselves and who had to negotiate among themselves. Uh, and that was, you know, that was complicated um, and there was no ultimate authority. And in some ways there remains no ultimate authority in Orville and it's both I think it's both like a, a strength and a weakness of the community. I mean, I think it's one of the reasons people say, oh, nothing gets done in Orville. And that may be true because people sit around bickering and not making decisions. But it's also probably one of the reasons the community survived 
is because it's given it a certain flexibility and there hasn't been a rule and a strict kind of top-down dogma that you know forces people to conform to the point where ultimately they say, I can't, I can't live here anymore, which is what happens in, in, in many of these communities. Right, that's interesting. Thanks, Akash. Um, we are almost coming towards the end of the salon. Um, anybody would like to ask any final thoughts from Akash? Especially anyone who hasn't asked any questions yet. Cheryl or Jeeva, do you have any thoughts? Cheryl? Hi. I just wanted to, first of all, I loved the book. I've read it twice. Oh, thank you. Um, it gave me a whole new view of my growing up. My father moved to Oroville for a period of time. Um, I didn't know much about it. I know it was magical. I know it was the highlight of his life. Um, he was very devoted um, to the mother and all that. I actually didn't have, I didn't want anything to do with it, but it gave me such insight in growing up in a, in a, I don't know if you want to call it a different family, a very different family. Mm -hmm. um, after reading the book, I was actually pretty grateful that I never went there, um, but I can also see the magic of it and what he felt in it. But the other thing, I kept wanting to know more about Jillian. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just, you know, that was, it was just reading the book. I, I just wanted to know a little bit more about her. Um, she fascinated me, mm -hmm. um, but thank you for writing the book and giving me a completely different view of, uh, or just more of an in-depth view of what attracted my father to, to yeah. go and live there. Thank you. When, so when was your father there? I've tried to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was in the um, very early 70s. Okay. What was his name? Uh, he, he went by Mickey Finn. He ran the, or the Orobindo Center in Boston. Okay. I will ask some of my friends well, who I were think he knew, at that time. Yeah, I think he knew um, Robert Lawler, and I know mm -hmm. he used to go to New York a lot right. um, to visit with people. Um, and, and I also think because of his life, having lived there and, and gone there, I think um, that actually saved him from a very destructive life that he had up until that point. Um, up until finding the father, it was, I think, the mother, excuse me, I think it was his savior. Um, but there's always been this issue of, you know, how could, you know, you have, you have kids here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you're supposed to take care of them and make a living. Yeah. Um, so there, I, I just had, I love that you were so compassionate about that. Uh, you showed it in such a it, it just, it really was, it's a beautiful book. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that was part of my goal was definitely to to try to show, you know, it didn't always turn out well, but to show the kind of the beauty and the nobility of the aspiration that that created Orovo. Um, and then let readers readers judge for themselves, you know, how, how much do you want to how much do you want to judge them for the things that went well or the things that went wrong? And, you know, it's it, at the end of the day, utopia is an attempt to surmount humanity, but these were all human beings. And, and some of them were very brave and noble human beings, um, some of whom made mistakes um, at times that cost them their lives. You know, the two main characters in the book, in my view, made a terrible mistake and they died as a result. But that doesn't change the fact that I think that their quest was beautiful and their aspiration and their faith and their love for each other was, was t totally beautiful and committed in a way that I think many people who live in, in the real world never touch and never find and never have. So people, people have to decide for themselves where they, where they come down on that, on that scale. Thank you. I think that's a very lovely note to end on, Tanya, shall we? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, that was fun, Thanks. guys. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for coming. Thank you for reading. And, uh, you know, I have a, a website if anybody wants to send me thoughts or comments. I'm always happy to get emails and, and, and engage. So thank you all. 
Thank you, Akash, for your time and thank you for joining and such a lovely conversation. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, Akash. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. bye.